going to introduce you to our class. He's going to read the present. He's going to read your presentation in Spanish, and then we can just uh, go ahead with the presentation. So I'm going to leave our student Sebastian Benitez. Sebastian, uh, no Benitez. Sebastian, can you can you help us with the introduction to Julia Skupchenko? Of course, teacher. And um, first of all. Uh, Julia es cofundadora de Think Tank for Sustainable Development, altercontacts.org, donde está ejecutando la iniciativa registrada de las Naciones Unidas, Empower Entrepreneurship. Fue la líder del equipo durante el hackathon paneuropeo en línea, Estados Unidos versus el virus, cuando el grupo de expertos presentó una propuesta para que la Comisión Europea garantice la capacidad de recuperación económica de los profesionales independientes y autónomos que sufren el impacto del COVID-19. Recibió cobertura de los medios de comunicación sobre el recurso con más de 2 millones de lectores. En su práctica personal como desarrolladora de negocios y asesora, Julia ha consultado a más de 100 empresarios, expertos, pequeñas y medianas empresas en todo el mundo. Es invitada regularmente a hablar en conferencias y cumbres internacionales para compartir su experiencia y estudios de casos sobre emprendimiento innovador y sostenible. Está nominada para el Premio Emprendedor 2020 e Innovadora Femenina del año 2020. Es escritora publicada para una revista internacional líder en línea para pequeñas empresas con millones de lectores, entrepreneur.com. También es anfitriona de la serie de entrevistas lockdowneconomy.org, donde empresarios de diversas partes del mundo y ocupaciones comparten cómo el bloqueo los ha afectado y cómo se ve su mercado ahora. Julia es cofundadora y mentora principal de la comunidad global de empresarios en línea, businessgreenhouse.org. También es mentora de negocios en el programa de inteligencia artificial en Rockstar Startup Accelerator en Ámsterdam y en la Escuela Superior de Economía en Moscú. Antes de fundar el Think Tank, Julia fue asesora estratégica en la innovación digital a nivel CEO 4 para una compañía Fortune 500. Allí coordinó la implementación de prácticas innovadoras en las divisiones clave de la empresa. Ha escrito un libro de jugadas internos sobre las mejores prácticas de innovación digital. Antes de eso, Julia era responsable de las comunicaciones, la participación de las partes interesadas y la defensa de terceros en una empresa FTSE 50. Julia proviene de la región del Ártico. Ella vivió y estudió en dos continentes, en cuatro países árticos. Ha escrito y enseñado dos cursos universitarios sobre desarrollo del norte. Es una de las autoras de la enciclopedia Barnes y hoy nos viene a presentar la conferencia Four Lessons from the Business that Survived the Lockdown. Así que muchísimas gracias por tu visita, Julia. Y Está bien fuerte aplauso. Thank you, Julia. Un fuerte aplauso para Julia. Es un fuerte aplauso virtual para Julia Skupchenko. Let's give a big applause, a virtual applause for Julia Skupchenko, who is visiting from Amsterdam from Lockdown Economy. So, Julia, the time is yours. I'll give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro, for inviting me uh, to, to speak today. And thank you for all of you to... Um, for this opportunity to share what I know with you and hopefully we can make it very, very interactive. I, I am not a fan of, you know, speaking for 40 minutes without stopping and, and then just expecting that you will learn something from that. I, I want to keep it more as a dialogue. So, so be prepared to go uh, un unmute yourself and, and speak. <laughs> uh, that's very uh, appreciated. Um, just to check that uh, the presentation is visible to everyone, right? Yes, excellent, all right. So, uh, and thank you very much to the Anavak Mayab University, of course, uh, this is our second uh, time collaborating with the MBA course. I'm very thrilled about it. And, you know, uh, in the due course of the presentation, I will tell you a bit more about uh, that as well. So um, today, I'm going to share with you the four lessons uh, from the businesses that survived the lockdown. Now, I didn't just dream them up. I didn't just come up with them. And of course, you, as you know, there are not that many um, sources of information right now of the real time information of what is happening with the business. Wh what are they doing? How are they dealing with the pandemic? There are no books. I mean, nobody was expecting some, something like this. So which is why in May uh, 2020, together with the experts of the Think Tank Alter Contacts, we started an initiative called Lockdown Economy. And to date, we have interviewed over 40 entrepreneurs all around the world from uh, over 15 countries and four continents in English and Spanish and Romanian. And we're preparing to go into Nepal and Arab into Arabic and, and 
into Nepalese and into Arabic and many other uh, languages and cultures and countries. All right, so those lessons that I'm going to share with you today is a sort of an extract of what I personally learned from those interviews and from those entrepreneurs. Okay, so, and with that, that we already covered. Okay, so what happened when the pandemic started is that 76% of um, the small businesses and self-employed people and micro businesses have uh, lost their clients due to the lockdown, due to the quarantine, social distancing. Of course, it brought a lot of uncertainty um, and anyone who was planning anything for 2020 in terms of growth, in terms of profit, in terms of uh, growing the customer base, I think was uh, really disappointed and really hurt. And I must say my business was one of the ones that also got hit uh, by the lockdown. I mean, as a facilitator of in-person workshops, you can imagine that nobody wanted to get in, in person anymore. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you in the room uh, already today share that you're entrepreneurs and you know better than maybe even my stories how it feels to run your business in these conditions and so the entrepreneurs I've, spo I've spoken with shared a few words that uh, described how was the first reaction to the pandemic to the lockdown and you can see it's it's very very negative it's uh, it's paralyzed it's fear panic you know it's the feeling of helplessness now um before before we get past the first reaction i think i'd like to ask you what was your own experience because especially the people who run their own businesses or they have their own family business how uh, maybe shortly tell me what was your own experience when the lockdown happened in mexico uh, can I? Uh, yeah, yeah, Humberto. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, in my in my family, my my wife is very panicked uh, because he had he have a a little a, a little business in in uh, for doing working with with wood with wood and photograph. So uh, she she must close the the business and fire two people. Okay. Uh, but in in our case, uh, I work in, in a pharmaceutical uh, health, so uh, I never have problems in my work. I continue working in my office fiercely. Then I, I work in home office for a for a little time, and then come back to my to my office. No, so all my my people in in church is is maybe have a family. Is, is, contract COVID, but mm -hmm. in, in my case, in my opinion, yes, the, the work is, the sales got down um, and not in a, in a critic case, okay? Okay. So, because my, the pharmaceutical, so uh, medical, medicines, medical, continue selling, okay? Continue yeah, absolutely. So there, so there is a bit of balance between, you know, there's there's a definitely a loss on the side of the service businesses, but there there's a growth on the side of the pharmaceutical. Thank you very much, Humberto. Uh, I see Sebastian. Se yeah, yeah, Sebastian. I wanted to share that at first we have some kind of fear, but just just weeks after it was mind opening. I I opened in a complete different way because we used to do a lot of things in a physical way. But then our mind started to think about how we can make this work in a more bigger way. Because in, in my case, I work in the marketing department of the university and we used to focus only in the local students. So after this happened, we started to make um, digital events and we started to realize that there were a lot of international people interested also. So it was like accelerating a process that we continuously stopped but needed to happen. Absolutely, Sebastian, and thank you very much for sharing. That that leads me very nicely into the next uh, part, which is, you know, there are two options that the main options that we have when something like that happens is either we give up, we say, you know, the store is closed, you know, everyone can go home, I do nothing, I stay, and, you know, that's it. Or, you know, if you're a true entrepreneur, or if you have no choice, uh, then you have to try. And also, um, I think what Sebastian shared is a good example of how um, 
things can change how um, it, you can take a new look at the situation and find opportunities maybe somebody else has examples of uh, of how you you know of the of the trying of looking for opportunities in this crisis I, oh, yeah. I have something to add oh no go go okay. go ahead Navila. <laughs> okay thank you well in my kids it was very difficult because I have a restaurant so many families depends uh, of the restaurant you know and they have their salaries and then when they tell us that we have to close and work uh, with a limit uh, persons uh, people I mean uh, it was very difficult because uh, the the people that works in the restaurants need their, their salaries, you know? Of so course. we have to still paying either if they're not working and then uh, we start to selling like right through, not in the restaurant. So it's a difficult decision because many families depends in that work. And uh, did you manage to, uh, Nabil, did you manage to uh, to go, for example, into deliveries or, you know, find some other way to, to recover the business? Yeah, uh, well, we have to reduce the salaries. Uh, we'll not give the, the same, per, the 100% of our salaries, but we gave the 70% of the salaries. Then we, well, when they were not working, you know, when they still in the houses. And then when they come back to the restaurant, uh, we pay the 100% of their salaries and well, we start uh, again, but only delivering food. Okay, well, that, that's, that, that has been a, a really a saver for a lot of restaurants to go into delivery as fast as possible. And of course, when you have employees uh, on your payroll, it's it's incredibly difficult because there's responsibility on your shoulders, and at the same time you are in the same boat with them, suffering from lack of clients, uh, closed restaurant altogether, and yeah, of course it's difficult. Uh, anyone else would like to share, um, you know, the experience of the lockdown with the business, you know, with the opportunities versus you know the hardships? Yeah. Um, me, Achilles. Uh huh. Um, I I used to work in a consultant group um, just that few months ago, and uh, at first everyone was scared because of the, you know, the constantly firing uh, of bigger enterprises to the to their personnel. So it was uh, really, as you say, I, I was really afraid that I would lose my job, but. Mm, um, we realized that it was kind of better if we all work in our homes because mm -hmm. even even if, if 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 it was not the like the usual thing that we have to do when when we go to work here we have we we used to go to the office to get around with the team and to you know uh, speak of of the ideas of how to to do things better and uh, so in the other side you see the other side of of, of the coin if you may say. Um, that when you go to, to your house, to your home, it, it, you have a, um, a lot of distractions and, uh, and maybe it's not the, the same way that you used to do your job, but this was, uh, um, I don't know how or why, but it was the, the uh, my, co my co-workers and uh, my bosses and everyone that was working there, uh, they, they performed their job better. Like uh, it was uh, more practical, more efficient uh, with, with less uh, counter times and, uh, I think it, it was uh, like something that it was meant to happen, but as my uh, as Sebastian said, it's something that that it would happen, but but you you just uh, you just stop it for a second, and um, I think it, it it's better for the for the bigger uh, enterprises to to do home office because they 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 save a lot of money in 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 the installations in the services, and at the end it was. Uh, a better way of working, if you may say, but it's uh, it's sad that it had to happen something like this to realize that we could do a better job uh, from our homes. It's true. I thank you very much, Ayelis, for that comment and for the story. Indeed, um, both from from your story and Sebastian's story, you know, about finding opportunities in the digital way of living. Um, it's it's a it's a shame that 
it had to to become a, it had to come to a global catastrophe for people to to realize that this was actually a good thing. You know, a, the digital uh, life was a good thing. So, but let's move on and let's go to the first lesson that I want to share with you today. Um, and and I very much respect the experience that you've had so far with the your businesses, and I'm looking for a contribution. So, as I said, these lessons are something that I extracted from the stories that I've heard. And uh, feel free to contribute to, to each of the four of them. You're more than welcome. So um, lesson one, of course, is cherish your clients. We all know that the clients are at the heart of your business. They are the ones who come to you and put the bread and butter on your table at the end of the day. And in the pandemic, in the lockdown, they were affected just as any business owner they had a lot of pressure they couldn't go anywhere maybe they were laid off maybe they were worried maybe they had to spend all their time with or looking after their children so for many businesses the fact that the clients and customers were so heavily occupied at home um meant that the you know meant that they're they're not coming anymore uh, if it's a digital offering if it's a coaching for example if it's anything uh, re regarding facilitation None of that was necessary. None of that was, you know, the something we have to have. You know, of course, grocery store, a store, or a medical, uh, or, or a drugstore, for example, are the things that people kept needing. But anything beyond beyond that was uh, quite unnecessary. But even in that moment, uh, a lot of businesses have found a way to make themselves useful to their clients. So first of all, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I interviewed have connected to their customers and asked them how they were doing. Because you need to know what's your customer, mar what's your customer, what your market is doing. What what are your customers are thinking about? What is their new pain, right? So there is a bit of both, so a bit of research and a bit of just uh, human uh, human attention to uh, to the people that you know. And of course. There were a lot of uh, opportunities to collaborate uh, on the free, on the pro bono basis and to create some new products and new ideas for the customers to help them to go through the lockdown. And this example that I want to give you is uh, from a lady uh, who is running a travel business in Paris. So she is an American and she has been, uh, since 1999, she has been focusing on um, African uh, American culture, uh, bringing um, uh, the tourists to Paris to, to show them um, the culture. Well, she she so, sort of called it the, the safe haven, the Paris uh, in France, the safe haven for, for the culture. And uh, there is a law that people don't know. And basically, that, that was her focus. Now, with the uh, United States closing the border and Europe closing the border to the United States, she practically couldn't exist anymore as a travel business. If people aren't allowed to travel, um, what is there to do for her? Now, you would think that she could stop or switch to European customers or give up or something else, but no, she continued connecting with the customers, uh, asking them how they're doing, and they were asking her when they can come to Paris and whether they can, they can refund their tours, whether they can move it to the next year. And she had to be extremely flexible and she continued to create, create uh, the blog articles where she talked about Paris and different um, issues that would be interesting for them. So she, would, she was creating the uh, online travel experience for them through writing, through reaching out. So um, here, I'm I'm very happy to open the floor for you guys to to share your experiences of what what can you say about the topic of of appreciating your clients during the pandemic. May I speak? Absolutely, Laura. Laura. Okay. I think even uh, before the pandemic, it, uh, the clients are always uh, too important for any business, but. Uh, as you said, for uh, after the the pandemic, the clients, uh, the businesses start appreciating even more the clients and, and the deep relations relationship with each one of them, because the clients were everything, and 
uh, even though the kind of business you can you you been in uh, you have to connect with your clients uh, and be there for them because there is your market and your product uh, your product to sell or something uh, that your business will grow if you connect with your clients so it was very important for any business to be there with every one of its clients and supporting them and making that like those link those links mm -hmm. which in, in clients with the business and business with the clients it, it was very important for anyone to do that absolutely laura thank you very much and it was a good opportunity to build the community with your clients for for many of those businesses it was a chance to to spend time a little bit more in the office and see how they all can come together yes sebastian i can see that you also want to speak yes i I completely agree with Laura in our department, at least a sales department. We developed a strategy where we started to make weekly Zoom calls with all of our clients that were interested in, in enrolling in the university, but not only with the students, but the, but the families. And it was really impactful how many, many families started crying in the Zoom meeting, saying that they weren't able to cover the tuition of the university anymore, and they opened up completely and they started to tell all of their feelings and what they really needed and what they really expected from us so it was a really big opportunity to also let the clients open up with us so we can so we could be able to understand them and after we finished them the all of this admission process we made a we made a survey to get to know what were the reasons that they motivated them them to enter to enroll in our university and the second one was the human touch and attention that we delivered that they were really that we were on the only university that was providing that moment of how are you feeling how is your family and the and the clients really valued those strategies so it was a moment for us to connect in a in a re, in more of a personal way rather than just business client more of a person to person i am i am going through the same thing i i have my family back there i am in my house also i really want to understand you and the clients really open up themselves yeah, absolutely. And it's nice way uh, to put it in you, like you said, person to person, because indeed using the words like clients and customers, but uh, for example, in restaurant industry, they're trying to use in hospitality, they use the word guest. So I think for a lot of us, we can substitute the word, the, the generic word customer and client into something more personal that people can relate to it. You know, for example, the prospective students or, you know, but I, it's a very good example. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And uh, yes, I can see Nabil, right? Yes, I want also to add that we were used to to went to the businesses, uh, so we were used to have clients, and now we have to go with the client to their homes and make make like more personalized the connection. Ah, uh, more personal. Um, so you get to know yeah. them but you also can deliver them the more personalized product, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yes. Yes, that's also a very, very good example because of course, when you deliver, especially if you don't hire a delivery service like Uber, but you, hire, but you, you do it yourself, you get to meet all of the people that would normally come to your restaurant. So that's a very, very uh, important in building a loyalty with your future uh, uh, customers, with your future guests. All right, um, so let's go to the next uh, lesson. Thank you very much for your examples. They were really, really good. Um, so the second lesson, of course, we are all in it together. Nobody can just escape and hide and say, well, I'm not part of it. We all have to collaborate one way or another and help each other to get over the pandemic and the situation we are all in, because otherwise, if you know, somebody is better off and the other one is completely on the verge of full bankruptcy, the world will not come back to the balance. You know, we all have to, you know, s step to the next, uh, to the more uh, sustainable level of our economic situation. And that's something also a lot of businesses understood. They understood that they're in the same boat. And even the competitors started um, 
teaming up and seeing what they can do together, maybe address some bigger company together with a, with a stronger value proposition. And uh, the example here is of Jane Birch. She's actually also a Parisian. I, I chose today for some reason uh, examples that are in France. Um, so she is based in Paris. She is an American who opened a cooking school of French cuisine for Americans. And of course, all her work is based around people and her business is an intersection of events, restaurant and, um, uh, and tourism. And she was, uh, she was mostly targeting the American market. And just like the other business, when the borders are closed, there's, there's no one traveling, first of all. Then second of all, the restaurants are closed. So she had to be closed for that reason. Now, she had, I think, a team of eight chefs who were hired to run those classes. And as an employer, you know, there's an even bigger responsibility on you. Like uh, Nabil mentioned that before in a restaurant, so she also has uh, staff that she has to continue paying because they have families. And she said that the best way was to start with strategic procrastination. You know, at the moment when you take a step back, you don't act on anything, you just observe the situation and you try to understand what would be the right thing to do, not just the short term, like a quick fix, but something that will be consistent with your vision, with your mission, with your um, longer term horizon. And what she and the team of uh, chefs came up with is video classes that were done uh, previously on live streams. Well, I don't know. And now they're done. Uh, they, they sell the video classes uh, as a pre-recorded thing. But on terms of collaboration, she actually approached one of the um, um, cooking supplies, uh, cooking, cooking supplies shops in Paris, one of the most established ones, where they used to source a lot of their own um, cooking uh, utensils and pots and pans and whatnot. And together with that shop, they put together a set that people who are following the classes can use at home, uh, a set for baking. And they made it bespoke. I don't know, maybe they even put some logos on it or some engraving or something special to make it very look uh, and feel nice. And they started sending it to their customers, to their homes. So even if the customers could not come, now through collaboration with, uh, with that shop and with the delivery services, they can still uh, bring the French cuisine into the houses of their guests. So I thought that was a, a, quite a nice touch. And the other collaboration they made is with a wine shop where they would choose a collection of six different wines and send it to their customers as well. You know, obviously not for free. That was the, the business proposition that they sell it, but they sell it all it together. So maybe here, I'd like to hear from you guys, uh, what are your example of great collaboration in the pandemic and in the lockdown? Uh, if I may speak, I have, yes. I, I think I have Thank the you, perfect mm -hmm. example. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was having actually, uh, before the pandemic started, I have, I was having a, a course of wine tasting. And uh, when the, when the lockdown starts, my teacher says, well, I, I'm, I will have to like uh, pause the course and maybe make it um, online. So when, when he starts the course, He's like um, uh, kind of like discovering or uh, maybe um, investigating what can he do for us, uh, for the students to be more like interesting. Finally, he pairs with uh, some restaurants, local restaurants, small restaurants, in fact, that they have uh, a series of different wines and from different regions and countries. And he says, okay, maybe we could do something. Uh, maybe a delivery of, a, like the example you said, maybe a delivery of a set uh, that it could be uh, not that expensive, but uh, maybe uh, in the capacity of everyone. So he like pairs with a lot of restaurants and managed to deliver uh, a set of maybe two or three wines. And if you can't, uh, can't buy it, on the online course, we can hear like the experience of each uh, student about every different type of, uh, of wine. And finally, uh, now he, that he is on the social media and, and all this, 
he's um well he he grew up a lot and now he has like two classes uh, maybe at weekends and he started like with five or ten students uh just uh, on friday and now he has a class of maybe 60 people uh friday and saturdays Okay, so that's a pretty, uh, pretty exciting example. I think there are several things that we can learn. First of all, that from bringing uh, a quite a personal experience where you have to be there and taste the wines, you know, by collaboration, you can deliver the wines to the clients at a good price, you know, at an affordable price so that the course is still yeah. interesting for them. Then another thing is uh, that you mentioned is the fact that he could grow his customer base significantly because imagine having to hire a space to feed the 60 people and then again finding the time when they can all come there and and then trying to give them this special experience because with wine we always expect something uh, luxury related because you know it's wine tasting right so yeah. um i think that's an excellent example of how you can you can turn a quite a difficult situation into a great opportunity so thank you very much rodrigo Anyone else You're about welcome. the collaboration? Well, I, I think... Uh, I yes, go ahead, Samantha. Uh, example, but I don't know if it's good. But in here, in Campeche, um, the business, small business uh, have uh, different stra strategies for for some of these things, no? And maybe um, implement some, um, how do you say, um, different strategies like giveaways or something like that. So mm -hmm. no, so people know everything in here, you know? And it's complicated because the people prefer uh things or uh, to usa or things to amazon or yeah things like that no and with this um people know about the things that um, oh my god uh ¿Quieres decirlo en español y te ayudamos? O sea, como cosas que venden en Campeche, o sea, como que son... Es que no, no, no me acuerdo cómo se dice. Eh, ¿Quieres decir? O sea... Locales. Locales, ajá. Locales. Cosas locales. Oh, the local, the local merchandise that they have in Campeche. Okay, thank you very much. That's a group effort for translating, but I, I sort of got the gist of what Samantha was saying. So you mean that uh, it gave a, um, the, the situation gave a um, rise to the consumption of the local products, local um, local things, um, and for people to get to know what is actually in their area rather than purchasing something from very far away from some global conglomerate, right? Um, so that's a good yeah. example. It's a good example. I don't know. I, if it's, it fits with collaboration, but it definitely fits with uh, alternative responses to pandemics. So that's also very good. But anyway, you know, we're going to have the, the adapt fast is the next lesson, adapt fast. And that's what you're saying. I think fits very well, Samantha, with, the, with adapting, because also on the side of people who are purchasing, on the side of customers, because, you know, they also need to adapt. You know, a lot of things became unavailable because of the supply chain um, uh, interruptions. And who knows how that's going to progress. OK, so the third lesson, and today I chose an uh, example of a um, barista, of an owner um, of a coffee catering uh, business. So um, Dave is a coffee catering uh, business owner. Uh, he comes to your event with a big espresso set. He like he he brings it on wheels. You know he sets it up. It looks beautiful. Any event where you have that coffee done by a barista in a pretty apron and everything looks amazing. And so it it used to be uh, an excellent addition to any event. Now of course you can imagine with the lockdown there were no events. And for coffee catering business that meant no business there were no options like you know nobody needed coffee at that time nobody i i doubt people even went to starbucks anymore 
not to mention some something so exclusive as hiring your own coffee caterer okay so what helped him to adapt into this situation is that he kept his operations very small it is him and his business partner and sometimes every now and then they hire a helping barista through you know maybe it's also an entrepreneur and then hire him for a day not for employment and because it's just two of them running the show and they didn't have any responsibilities towards employees they didn't have anything um that they had to attend to immediately to you know for example they don't have a space like an office that they don't have to keep paying rent for it and because of those minimalistic approach to operations he could adapt fast and change his um time allocation when he saw that there are no events like everyone canceled and at least for two months ahead because in amsterdam the lockdown started on like 17th of march i think and finished on first of june and when he saw that that's going to be like that and there's no flexibility there's no option he just said well look i'm going to start learning how to do online marketing of my company and i'm going to spend more time with my family because there's no need to keep banging on the door trying to push the coffee catering into the space where nobody had having any events and that of course saved him a lot of you know energy and mental health because you know it's difficult when when you as a business owner you sit and you think maybe if i knock on a few more doors today then i can get a client and you know that urgency that pressure like kind of pushes you to the edge of the nervous tension and i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that feeling like maybe i should do something else today to maybe it will work he said no clearly nothing's gonna work right now so i better just improve on my knowledge i better just improve on my skills have the time with the people i love and then when it all figures itself out which it will eventually i will uh, restart activities with my clients but he of course kept calling them every now and then just checking in saying how they're doing saying that they have a healthy business and that uh, they can weather this pause because a lot of businesses you know had a cash flow problems but that's that's a different story so um we already had quite a few examples of people and businesses adapting but maybe somebody else would like to speak and share their uh, somebody they know or a business they run I would I, like to may I speak yes i have you know victor then pamela thank you thank you um well my dad has a a business of uniforms and and clothes t-shirts and things like that and he was thinking before the covid to to restart his his business model to make everything online to make a platform so so their clients can um Say, uh, have a uh, buy on online and he was thinking to make a platform but but he his uh, his business model has has I don't, I don't know maybe 20 or 30 years and he was he has absolutely no idea to how <clears throat> sorry to how make this change and he contract uh, some personal that are making uh, a new platform to to make uh, online sales but we we have uh, eight or nine months with this problem in the world and he's he's not uh, understanding completely how to change a business model and I think uh, persons uh, people like me and and many of you how to we, we don't know how to restart a business model that has uh, many that has many years and it's difficult to live with this problem like like the normal we have to to restart everything and to to change many things that we that we know how to to use like go a restaurant or or go to buy something now everything has to be online virtual and we have to adapt for for this and i think for the big uh, for the big companies it's very difficult like here it says in the presentation keep it small keep it simple and i think for the big for the bigger for the uh sorry for for big companies this is 
well, this is more more difficult than than companies that are starting. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Victor. That is a very valuable contribution uh, to the discussion. And I think you're right. I mean, if we look at starting entrepreneurs at somewhat younger digital generation and at people who are self-employed with uh, no capital investments, the, the transfer into the new dimension, into the pandemic world, you know, is a bit easier because, okay, well, before I had coffees with people in person, now I have coffees with people over digital screen, you know, okay, I can deal with that. But of course, when you have something where you invested money into the physical space, when you have administration operations, many people involved, and you know how to do it in in in-person world, it must be incredibly difficult to even imagine how to start transferring different bits and pieces into the digital world. And uh, of course, if the person doesn't have enough digital knowledge, that's yeah you know the business model is one thing the, the digital digital education is another thing right now i think uh, it is called the digital divide uh, the 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 gap that people have when they need to work in a new way but thank you very much victor for that and pamela i think you wanted to also add something yes i wanted to add something that since i work in an automotive industry as you said no one want to buy a coffee right now for sure, no one wants to buy a car right now. So we were completely, completely closed like for two months. And it's not a company, you know, we can work online. It's a production company. So we cannot do anything by computer. We need to be there and we need to do all the production process. So it was for sure like really complicated uh, these two months that we were completely closed. And for sure, we depend on the demand that we have. In this case, we work with BMW. So we depend completely in all the demand that BMW has and until they get us like the release that they will start working because even we had a lot of problems with the government because they will not let us go even a little quantity of people. So we have to do like a lot of uh, documents and everything so they can let us start working but we are a few quantity of people. And also since we are in the company like 3000 people, we are a lot of people, we have to start as I'm working as a production engineer to start to change all the processes that we have to have all the um, distance that we need to have in the people. We need to split the groups. We need to do like a huge change in the process that we work. And also it was a lot of investment in the company with, because of the transportation of the food and new equipments that we need to buy just to make it separate for all the people and the split the groups. So it was really difficult, but at the end, we adapt a little bit uh, time by time. Uh, the, at the beginning, we, we were like a small group of people and then we start to, to, to increase our people. But this is the way we have been working now. Yeah, absolutely. With the office of, thank you, Pamela, with the office of 3,000 people uh, and, and the operations like uh, autom automobiles is, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm afraid to even start imagining what it is like, you know, on a business owner side of, of that of that branch, for example. All right, so I see that the time is running, although I really like uh, that you all participate so actively and that you share with me the insights that you have because that's very valuable uh, for, for all of us here to, to, you know, to learn as much as possible from each other. And the last lesson I would like to share today is stay active. So through the lockdown, through pandemic, the worst thing people could do is to just lie down on the couch and say, this is it, I cannot do anything. Even, even if the clients aren't paying, even if it doesn't look like you can go out and sell your coffee to people, you still have to be active. You know, Mark Twain said that if you find the, um, the thing that you love to do, you will not have to work a day in your life. And I think the, the lockdown really showed to a lot of people that they have to find that thing that they love to do because you have to continue doing something that brings you joy that brings you an energy and that also do it is important for others in one way or another so Bicila Bococo is a business developer uh, from New York um, she was also a paid uh, keynote speaker at many events and both businesses that she had were in person so with the business development of course to, to make businesses go international, she'd have to travel to the location 
find out how it's run, find out what's the operations, what's uh, the management, what are the processes, and so on and so forth. And from that point, she can see how we can uh, scale to different countries. Without that, with the borders closed, of course, she could not travel anywhere anymore. So she had to be put. And she said that was the longest time that she stayed at home in, 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 the, in the last 10 years or something. Um, another thing that she did was paid speaking. And of course, if events are canceled, nobody needs a speaker. And even if they're, they're online events, but you know, there's so many people who want to speak that you really don't have to pay them. And that jeopardized her another business model. But nevertheless, she persevered. She said, you know what? I'm just going to start, start doing something useful that I think is useful for people. So she started recording her uh, videos, um, business help videos in Spanish and in English, about uh, five minutes long each, and just giving the energy to entrepreneurs out there. She's a very inspiring speaker. I advise you to, to watch the talk and um, to learn directly from her. But staying active and being an entrepreneur. She said that um, being an entrepreneur is an act of service. So you can just stop doing it. And uh, with that, I think um, in the interest of time, I will, you know, I will give you another opportunity to speak uh, so that we can you know, close uh, with your feedback to me. But for now, let's just summarize the lessons. So basically, the clients are at the heart of the business. You need to collaborate. We all need to collaborate if we want to get out of this pandemic, of the lockdown, and of this new normal. And we need to adapt. And of course, we have to be active. So I have started this presentation with introducing a little bit the lockdown economy. And I would like you to share a little bit more about what it is. In the essence, we interview entrepreneurs around the world. And in this, we ask them the same set of questions. And we find out how the lockdown affected them and their businesses and how they dealt with it. So what were the challenges, but what were their ideas, the solutions, and what they need help with right now? That brings them closer together. That, that educates us about what's happening in the world. You know, right now, we might be the only source of real-time information about entrepreneurship. And we target practically mostly the small business, micro businesses, and self-employed people. And this initiative has been registered with the United Nations as, uh, as acceleration action towards sustainable development goals. Let's not forget that you know this, this whole pandemic, this whole crisis have set back the world in reaching those goals about at least 20 years in some countries really many, many decades back because if uh, all the children were made to stay at home and in some countries they don't have computers they don't have they're not digital enough for example for children to be online and study online because the studying was done in a hut so for in those places of course the time is moving backwards nevertheless we do what we can and today i've presented you with the insights we got from the lockdown economy so far and we're going to collect and we're going to find out, uh, we're going to collect more and we're going to find out more. So, um, yes, now that the world is going through such foundation shaking change, it is more important than ever that we can tell a story of what is really happening to the business and help one another rebuild our own ventures and the world, one entrepreneur at a time. And with that, I would like to invite you to help us um, after this uh, session or you know how Alejandro will instruct you please go ahead and watch those videos uh, leave your comments because comments is something that helps other people also to understand the content of the videos you know your take on it how you would react how what would you do because we uh, we want to make it a melting pot of ideas so if you have a recommendation for some business owner that is on interview please put it in the comments because they will see it. And if you want to work or help somebody um, around the business, among the business owners that we interviewed, please also reach out to me or to them directly. And I must say that we have actually, thanks to Alejandro and thanks to one of his students from Ute Poniente, uh, we now have a Mexican edition of Lockdown Economy done in Spanish in Yucatan. 
And we also have another edition in Mexico City. So it's done in Spanish. It goes live on Facebook every week. So please follow us and watch it. And uh, for everyone on this call who have a business, I would like to invite you for the interview, to give an interview to Ronnie or to Flavio and to go on a live stream and share your experiences in Spanish. And with that, I open the floor for your feedback and for your questions. Hi, Julia. Uh, I have a question. Yes, thank you, Alejandro. Yeah, well, um, after this presentation, I, I was thinking about the context of Mexico and the context of Europe or the United States with the small businesses. Here in Mexico, um, the the majority of the businesses are informal businesses. Almost the sixty percent of the I think that sixty percent of the businesses are informal. The for the the rest, about the forty percent, are formal businesses. I'm talking about the I'm talking about the small businesses. And here we have a. I think that the problem here is that the federal government is not helping helping the formal businesses enough enough because we have obligations like paying the employees taxes and buying our products to resell but with the pandemic we have well many businesses have no um, have, have no money have no clients yeah and the context here in the country is not is not like in europe yeah uh, what do you think about this i think it's a about the small companies in mexico that are becoming the formal small companies that are becoming informal yeah they need to they need to fire people to not pay taxes yeah they need to close do not pay rent mm -hmm. and everything is going back yeah that that's that's my question thank you very much alex for the question i mean this is not something we can answer uh especially not in, in two minutes uh or or five minutes it's a very very big issue I think uh, what you're saying is absolutely true, especially for Mexico. I'm sure the um, the situation, the, the amount of liabilities and obligations that the government put on businesses doesn't compare to the lack of help, you know, that there's no help and then there are all these obligations. I must tell you though, that in Europe, um, maybe it's better because the situation, economical situation was better before the lockdown but in terms of the subsidies and closing and paying employees, it, it's still a huge burden. So, in, and uh, to the switch from formal to informal, I, we have to find out how to deal with it together. You know, I'm, I'm coming here to you with the, with the insights that I've learned from fellow entrepreneurs. I hear my echo. I don't know why. Okay, never mind. Um, but this situation can only be solved together. So if you have ideas on how we can address or help those businesses, or maybe how can they address the government all together as a movement, you know, so they help in one way or another, uh, then then reach out and then let's start thinking because it's not something that I know the answer to. Yes, Sebastian. Julia, I have a I have a question. And this lockdown hit us all of us in really different ways. And some businesses have changed completely their business model. But this lockdown is also going to finish. It's going to end and we're going to go back to new, new normal. So and I do a, the new normal in a really different way. My mm -hmm. question is how the business how a business can know 
if the correct way is to keep the same business model in a digital manner, go back to the older business model, do a hybrid because in my experience and in, in our sales team, we have started to get more and more customers from all around the world, but we started to lose our local ones. So we don't know which way is the right one. If it's keeping in the digital, going all back and hybrid, what are your insights in, in this particular situation? Well, to that, I would like, thank you for the question, Sebastian. I, for, to that, I, I have a reference of a very interesting video. So the, one of the interviews we recorded with Fabrizio Faraco, also the think tank expert, um, he is helping businesses to strategize. So he is a strategy expert. And I think for to he in his video answered that question much better than I can. But to sort of paraphrase what he says is that you have to sit down, assess the situation, assess all possible scenarios and how you would react on those scenarios and see what opportunities are easier to grab and then in two weeks, sit down again, assess the scenarios, and assess what opportunities are easier to grab. In this moment, the most important is to keep strategizing. That's, I'm just quoting him, because you cannot know for an, even a one month ahead. Yes, the lockdown will be finished. There, there will be some new way of doing things that will become normal eventually, uh, but nobody knows what it's gonna be. So, Every two weeks, for example, that's that at least that's what we do with our agile businesses. You know, we we just sit down like, okay, is this working out? What do we need to change? What is the new priority? And you have the one thing in mind that you're sort of moving towards. Um, you know, in with the lockdown economy is how to make the lockdown economy stay and grow and involve more entrepreneurs and how to make them interact, how to build online courses. And then every two weeks, I have a set of new priorities on what I need to focus on right now. And I think you it's like you have to play by ear, you know, to 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 <laughs> to be idiomatic. But I highly recommend the interview with Fabrizio Faraco. And also um, we made a little academy video from it, two, three minute snippets, where he just says one, two, three, four, what you need to look at. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you, Sebastian. Any more questions? Any more feedback? Yeah, uh, yes, I see uh, Samadhi. Yeah, uh, well, in general, uh, we know that we depend on our clients and we have to be empathic and we have to focus on uh, focus on all our all the actions to satisfy the, their needs. But it's a changing market and, and I think it's necessary for any business to, to observe and pay attention in technologies. But for you, what have been the conclusions for continuing the, their business in a future? What are the most important recommendations? You mean concerning digital? In general, I mean, with the pandemic, what have been the most uh, important conclusions for recommend to any business? I think the most important ones I already shared in the lessons, so that the, the four lessons that I, I shared with you today are, would be the most important conclusions. In terms of, really really conclusions are there none because we're still in it we're still in the process of trying to adapt and trying to deal with it and what i keep um sort of propagating is that we need to think together there's no one expert we're in a situation where everyone is a novice you know everyone is an amateur so the best way is to have some guiding principles some some guiding ideas but to, to merge the brains together and to see what comes out. But, you know, if I told you this, this, and this, and this, and this, you have to do, and then suddenly you apply it in Mexico to your business, and it doesn't work at all because it's a completely different situation. That's part of the reason why we're doing also local, local editions because some of the things that from Amsterdam or from Thailand are completely irrelevant in Mexican, uh, you know, uh, circumstances. But thank you for the question. Any, any, yes. Go ahead. Can I? Yes, well, uh, as your point, which one was the, the sector, the industry, like, were it more affected by, by the pandemic? 
Oh well, that, there's there's almost no no doubt about that. Thank you for the question. It's a, it's a service industry. It's a tourism, hospitality, um, anything that involves in person. It's a, well service industry as it is, and I highly recommend um, a few reports that came out. So, for example, one report is uh, on micro, small, and business and medium sized enterprises by the International Council for Small Business. That's a very good report uh, with some recent findings. It was published, I think, at the end of June or July even. Uh, there is a report by United Nations. There is a report by uh, International Labor Organization on who's been affected the most. Um, there is a report, the recent report by Global Mon uh, Entrepreneurship Monitor that um, has surveyed over 5,000 businesses into how they were affected and they have all the numbers and even the country profile so i highly recommend to do a reading um to 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 find out really in detail but okay so i must say these questions are you know quite a handful i do appreciate it um maybe alejandro you can you can rescue sure. me from no it's from okay. the q a <laughs> no it's okay it's okay actually i know you guys have more questions if you, you you can be free of, of you know sending to my email and I just address them to to Julia and here's the thing with the comments with the comments I'm sorry with about the interviews that she was talking about the lockdown economy there are six interviews that we have previously selected for you there is Fabrizio Paracco there's Jen Birch uh, who else would that be Julia it's Jen Birch. I think Bisila Bococo maybe I also recommend it it's Pum Narudi um, and yeah. and Shayun T. Chatterjee. Exactly. They have like six or seven interviews that we have put into Google Classroom. Remember that these interviews, you have to go into Google Classroom, just select what interview do you want to check, and then you have to write your comment on YouTube. It's part of your grades for this course, and we are very happy to have you here, Julia. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few words before we give you a big applause. Do you want to say something else? Well, I just want to make sure that, you know, as I said many times, you know, there's no one expert. Today I shared with you what I knew. I also learned quite a lot from you, so thank you very much for that. And, you know, Alejandro has my email and, you know, lockdowneconomy.org is the place for you to go. You are all welcome to volunteer with us. If you feel like you want to, to make a difference, you know, uh, a person on the women empowerment, um, Maria, and uh, somebody has the social impact. Mm, who told me about social impact? Ah, La me. Laura, Laura. Yes. So, the girls, if you really want to make social impact and empower women, you know, you know what to join. Lockdowneconomy.org. Go to our site, find out what you want to do, and yeah. And for everyone else, for everyone else, if you have a business please reach out to either to me or actually go to lockdowneconomy.org to the pinch of mexico and you will find the emails of ronnie and flavio and you can just address them to say i want to be on an interview i want to share my experience with the mexican uh with the mexican society and with thank the world because we are watching them and we are writing them so um, thank you very much thank you for this time and for this opportunity thank you so much julia let's give julia a big virtual applause to julia and applause virtual for julia Thank you so much for your time, Julia. We'll, we'll let you know as soon as we have the comments here in to YouTube, so you can just check it out. See Thank you very much. Soon, Julia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Muchas gracias, chicos. Eh, a ver, déjeme apago nada más la cámara. A ver, detener la transmisión. Muy 